So we're just going to have to start adding that to our HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. Cyber safety is patient safety. (laughs) I don't know what you're going to do, but that's your problem. (laughs) That's too Uh, much already. (laughs) You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax. HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to episode 448 of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs and joining me is Donna Grindle of Carden. Good morning, Donna. Good morning, David. Wake up. We got to get this done. Well, you know, we, we, we had to do a special recording so I could handle some family stuff during our normal recording time. So it's, you know, it shakes me up to have to switch and have energy necessarily at different times yeah this is a morning recording normally we're doing afternoon recordings which we did morning recordings for a while (laughs) yeah it was always a challenge and and we know on this one we got a lot to cover so i'm trying to yeah okay yep so don't wander too far we don't want to do that which means we also don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this intro so let's get to it uh, we do want to say thank you to those people who leave us a review and who send us their love from all around the world. We appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, if you'd like to leave a review, please do. Take one second to click that button, leave us some stars, and leave us a review. We appreciate it. You can uh, find us at helpmewithhippa.com. Now, one thing we definitely got to mention is the Pricec Boot Camp. The early bird pricing ends on that the day after this episode is released, correct? That is correct. All right. So April 9, 10, 11, and 12, three and a half days, we're putting on the HIPAA Privacy and Security Boot Camp that'll blow your mind. So you definitely need Mm -hmm. to be there. It is mind-blowing, that is for sure. Yeah, I've seen a lot of ticket sales come through, so I'm assuming we still have a few seats left. Uh, Well. I got a message from uh, Elizabeth saying, somebody wants to know how many people can they send? How many will we allow them to send from one group? And I'm like, "Uh, well, we're going to need to look at that because, you know, it's like, well, how many do they want to send? Because, you know, you're talking sending 20 people. There's no way we would want to do that. So anyway, yes, there's a there's a lot of questions pouring in all of a sudden. But as you get closer to the end of early bird pricing, that's when you get the most questions, right? That is the facts. But card and club members and HIPAA for MSP members get special pricing, uh, way better than everybody else. And theirs is any time. So if you want to get really good pricing and you haven't signed up for Card and Club or HIPAA for MSPs, or if you're in HIPAA for MSPs, you also are in HIP Card and Club. It's complicated, but not. Then uh, go check it out and uh, get signed up because uh, it's going to be cool. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too, as always. And you can find us by going to thehippabootcamp.com or pricecbootcamp.com. Either way. You'll find us. Dot com. Dot com. (laughs) Uh, Always my favorite. So uh, today we're going to be talking about a couple of cool things. One, we're going to talk about in our HIPAA briefs, uh, some interesting stuff about AI because AI. And and then the other, our main topic is going to be talking about how we're going to be taking the cybersecurity within healthcare from critical to stable condition in five years. There's actually an action plan for that. Yay. Yeah, so we'll be covering that. So first of all, let's dive into our briefs. Ready? Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was reading, reading some of my stuff this morning, and I saw a post, uh, an article, that OpenAI and Microsoft have disrupted nation-state attackers' malicious use of AI, which obviously is chat GPT. So mm-hmm. as I'm reading through it, as with a lot of things that you and I read through, it's more of a confirmation of what we know or what mm-hmm. we've said. And, uh, but I thought it was interesting to dive into this briefly because HIPAA briefs, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just to understand a few things that I pull from the article. One is we, even though we know the criminals are using 
ChatGPT and other platforms, we have made some assumptions about how they're using it. This is actually telling us exactly how they're using it because they track it. So here's a few things. They use it to translate technical papers, which is funny. <laughs> because it's probably translating from English to something else. Uh, retrieve publicly available information on multiple intelligence agencies and regional threat actors. Assist with coding. Research common ways processes could be hidden on a system. Scripting support mm -hmm. related to app and web development. Generating content likely used for spear phishing campaigns. Researching common ways malware could evade detection. Identifying experts and organizations focused on defense issues in the Asian Pacific region. Understand publicly available vulnerabilities, help with basic scripting tasks. And then lastly, open source research into satellite communication protocols and radar imaging technology. Whoa. Yeah. Interesting stuff. So those are the ways they're using it. Now, the other thing that should not be a shocker here is that this also tells us that everything that you're doing in these AI platforms is absolutely being monitored, stored, and examined. <laughs> mm -hmm. So be careful what you're putting in, especially if it's PHI or any other things. And quite honestly, there's some, there's some things I've done within chat GPT that I'm like, you know, it's for fun and games. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but uh, you know, it's also they're probably building a profile on me, which is going to be ridiculous because of some of the yeah. stupid things I've done with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. After just you and your wife having fun uh, arguing with it, uh, uh, yeah, it's yeah. going to be uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the the other thing that's well, let me mention this last thing. Uh, so the last part is that uh, they do make a point to say that although the OpenAI on Microsoft did temporarily contain the threat. They also acknowledge that there are plenty other powerful AI systems out there. They're widely accessible and it's going to be very, very difficult to control how these things are being used. So mm -hmm. ultimately did they make a dent? I don't know, maybe a ding, not necessarily a dent, <laughs> but <laughs> it is, it does make me feel better that they are looking at these things and that they are proactively doing things about them. So that does make me feel some better about this. So except uh, knowing what they're looking at that you're doing. Right. Well, I don't really care, honestly, <laughs> because it's all crazy anyway, but there, there's a, yep. there's a lot of things about AI and, and especially with over the next year that, that has me concerned. One is the video aspect of it. So probably since our last conversation, there's been two other things that, that aren't on our list here. One is the fact that chat GPT went flipping nuts the other day and started spitting out gibberish all over the place. And so that was like major news. And then mm -hmm. secondly, chat, um, uh, open AI released Sora, which is their video AI text to video. And it's not mm -hmm. widely publicly available yet, but it, obviously it will be shortly. My real concern for this is I don't know. There are many more very, very, very bad ways this can be used than I think good ways <laughs> that this can be used. Well, here's the thing that uh, the one you're not even hitting on here is the case in Hong Kong where the employee was on video calls because they were being told to transfer money and we're talking millions of dollars and they were being told to transfer money. They followed the protocols and did the video call. What they didn't know is, you know, they were being sent links to these video calls, which everybody just, oh, okay, that's coming from so-and-so. So, you know, you get, you get in the video call, and it's deep fakes for two different leaders of the company confirming to do the wire transfers. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's crazy. In and of itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, but they got, I think the article was what, $25 million? Yeah. So, I mean, it's worth the effort, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But I mean, the employee followed the protocols to do everything they're supposed to do. Yeah. Which, which is so, to say, if that is your protocol, you know, call people or whatever, which is exactly what we tell people to do, that's got to change. 
that's got to start changing. Yeah. You got to really look at that. How are you going to handle that? <laughs> it's going to have a code word. It, yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's what I was going to say. You have to have a code word, or maybe even even beyond a code word, you might have to have like a code signal. You know, like, hey, if I stick my finger at my left nostril, that's the signal or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> that's a perfect segue moment to episode one. <laughs> yeah, which, uh, you know, because this one is about Green Ridge Behavioral Health. And so a couple things about this one. One is that somehow it dropped and didn't drop. At the same time, <laughs> in, yeah. a, in October. <laughs> so it's uh, it's dated. Well, we saw this on the last one. It's dated October 2023, but it got announced and not like a big press release that we're used to seeing. It just gets in the listserv just, you know, yesterday. this week. Yesterday. Well, yeah, the other last weird, night. weird thing about it was the time. Like it got released at like 7 yeah. p.m. Eastern, which is like, what? Normally, these things yeah. are earlier in the day. So. Yeah. So I'm not even sure what all's happening there. So it, it is a the second case of a resolution agreement and corrective action plan due to a ransomware attack. Mm -hmm. And this ransomware attack was in February 2019. 14,000 patients. So we're not talking a giant institution like the last one. 14,000 patients. The resolution amount is $40,000, but a three-year corrective action plan. Pow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That it's just kind of tells you that they need a lot of help in their program. Well, and they may have negotiated the amount down by extending their corrective action plan, which means they're being monitored by the Office for Civil Rights. So for three years. You're having to file reports, and anybody violates uh, policies and procedures or rules, you got to report that back to the Office for Civil Rights and so on and so forth. So a lot happening, and that's a three-year that started back in October. So we already – and so now this just makes it hard for me to figure out what year to put it in. I'm putting it in the year it was released, <laughs> uh, like announced. Uh, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we did get our, you know, our normal, what we look for, the point they're trying to get, quote, in the email, though, on the uh, OCR Privacy and Security Listserv. If you're not on those, I strongly recommend you go do it uh, so you get these things. Or you could just wait for us to tell you what we see. But David gets to do the quotes uh, because I get tongue-tied, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> words they're hard uh, i know yep so uh so melanie rainier or rainer actually rainer says uh ransomware is growing uh to be one of the most common cyber attacks and leaves patients extremely vulnerable these attacks cause distress for patients who will not have access to their medical records therefore they may not be able to make the most accurate decisions concerning their health and well-being Healthcare providers need to understand the seriousness of these attacks and must have practices in place to ensure patients' protected health information is not subject to cyber attacks such as ransomware. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's nothing, you know, other than the three-year corrective action plan, you know, this is like most of them. Uh, and in the corrective action plan, again, I just wanted to point out, because often we hear this is not necessary, is that within 60 days of the effective date and annually following the effective date, and this is Green Ridge Behavioral Health in Washington, D.C., metro area, they shall, so within 60 days, they've already done this first time, but now annually. And this was something that was important. Annually, review all relationships with vendors and third-party service providers to identify business associates and make sure you have, you know, your contracts and all those things in place. So, uh, note to self. You know, there's a reason why they tell them to do that. I'm just saying. 
Yeah. The other right. thing too so, is I don't. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, this might drop after the fact, but it is time for your um, your annual reporting. Should you had something come up in 23 that was less than 500 patients? Yeah, you should have already done it by the time this comes. Yeah, out. that's what I'm thinking. So, just a reminder: if you haven't done it, rut row. <laughs> <laughs> end of february that is the time yeah and you know this this year being a leap year is exactly why i say just do the end of february it because it's whether it's the first or the second you, you, don't mess with that just do the end of february <laughs> that's you know? right yep why make it hard for yourself anyway so there you go let's uh let's get to the big news which we've been having to hold on to this. One of those many things that we can't talk about until it's publicly released. And uh, and this was, uh, it, by the time this comes out, it will have been announced in Los Angeles at the big Vive conference, which is the CISOs and all of those folks. And it is the Health Sector Coordinating Council Cybersecurity Working Group, which 405D is part of, but it's a much bigger group. And there are a lot of different task groups within it that one of the task groups that has been working for the last 20 months to lay all of this out is HICSPA. (laughs) HICSPA. Yeah. It's a health industry cybersecurity strategic plan for 2024 to 2029. So the idea is... Uh, you know, the whole concept is taking the health industry cybersecurity posture from critical condition to stable within five years. Yeah. And you know what? The big thing, it is imperative of protecting the health sector is a shared responsibility. The imperative of protecting the health sector is a shared responsibility across all independent subsectors of the ecosystem. Yeah. And interdependent ones as well. Yeah. So this puts patient safety in the center while supporting innovation, resilience, and the move to the future of health. (laughs) The future. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So, um, First, uh, just a few things about this plan. It's uh, it's co-chaired and worked on with HSCC and HHS. So I know we throw around a lot of things. HSCC, Health Sector Coordinating Council, Cybersecurity Working Group. Yes, but it's forward-looking and strategic. It's not saying let's fix what we got going on right now. It's like how can we move forward? How can we not only... Defend what's happening today, but prepare for the future. And it should cover all industry sectors. It's designed, this big report is designed for the C-suite executives, IT, and security leaders to help them plan for moving forward. And the plan includes measurable outcomes across the multiple subsectors. So it's like... We're saying this is where we should be. And are we there or not? Let's determine it. It's not just general ideas. So they they have worked very, very hard, the group that was doing this. This is one of those things where, you know, there's so many opportunities for us to get involved with what we do with 405D and HSCC. And it's great. I love the idea of doing more. Mm-hmm. But I'm already, you know, the co-lead on the 405D ambassador. I'm on the Wave 1 collateral development group. And I'm also in a review group for the lands- next updated healthcare landscape analysis. So I can do more. And it really is important to understand that this takes a lot of people working on additional, you know, this is not their job day to day for most of them. And we came up with this plan or they came up with the plan that we're all part of and committed to moving forward with. And uh, so uh, the guiding principle, we're going to try to hit 
as much of this concept as possible without doing a technical discussion. This is not about the technical parts. Remember, this is for decision makers and leaders, not for the dig deep in and do it. Mm -hmm. That's what the outcomes, you know, you get down to. So the following operational and governance principles guided the development of the HICSPA. I don't know. SP. HIC SP. HICSP. We're running into issues. <laughs> the HICSP. <laughs> yeah, HICSP. Yeah. So, just just remember yeah. though, anything you see that starts with HIC, you know, health health industry, cybersecurity, and then everything after that is something related to it. <laughs> yeah. HIC dash. Okay. That's what I'm looking for. Let me look at that list. Yep. Uh, but the number one operational and governance principle, cyber safety is patient safety. Yep. Patient safety is core and cybersecurity is critical to both clinical operations and patient safety. So I remember when you said, hey, I think that this should be our tagline you know, HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. Mm -hmm. That was a long time ago. <laughs> it was. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, we've been, again, you know, trying to get that message out for a long time. And I'm thrilled to see, you know, this is looking at a much bigger thing than just HIPAA, like we are, uh, where we started. Now we're part of the much bigger thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it. It still is. It's a bigger thing to say cyber safety is patient safety. That adds on to what we were trying to get across. Yep. And it's nice to see that we were way ahead of our time yet again. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, though, we drive off the road when we're way ahead of our time. <laughs> we drive on the dirt roads, that's for sure. <laughs> well before they get paved. <laughs> Yeah, and you can't you can't even see the the, the dust when people come after <laughs> it and come behind us. Sometimes it's like, really, you weren't here. We we got here first. No, nope, we already cleared that. <laughs> but then the number two guiding principle is it is a shared responsibility. Yeah, I'd still love to be able to get that to sink in. Yeah, well, I mean, it has to. This is part of the plan. The only way we can get to where we need to be and and a stable condition is where we need to be. We can't keep going like this. Only way we can get there is through a shared responsibility model. Mm -hmm. And I love this. And this was like part of the message when we were, you know, they reviewed the plan with all of us before it was announced. So, uh, this particular part, Greg Garcia was really, um, you know, really pointing out that every organization should be able to, quote, see themselves and what actions they can take or influence to achieve one or more objectives of the strategic plan. So everybody, anybody involved should be able to do this. I'm going to let you do the third one because we know I'm going to fumble all over that statement. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so number three is the symbiotic security and interoperability. Yes. Meaning we have to protect the sensitive data, the trademarks, the intellectual property. But at the same time, we have to share data and be interoperable. Inter see, there you go. <laughs> and promote interoperability <laughs> to enable informed care delivery. So we have to talk to each other. And for a period of time, there were all these great things that were happening, but the vendors were creating silos. I'll only talk to my partners. I will only talk to my applications. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's not going to happen anymore. We're, we're already down that path. Yeah. And then here's the one that's near and dear to our heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mutually enabling privacy and security. Yeah. Because they, they are they different. Did. Yeah. But the same, they're intertwined, they do cross paths, and the, a paper they released prior to this, which we haven't even had time to really go through, but it explains how privacy and security need to be a coordinated effort, 
not two independent processes. Which, I don't know, David, that sounds like Prisec to me. <laughs> exactly <laughs> what it is. And y'all are like, why you want to call it Prisec? Yeah. Again, dirt road. Can't have one uh, without the other. Well, I guess you could, but it's not <laughs> it's not the key goal here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the thing is, you know, privacy informs what it is you're going to protect. And security informs how I need to manage that data that I need to protect. So, you know, they're, they're, they're there. Yeah. There's there, there. Well, it definitely speaks to what we always say, which is don't look at the compliance side of things. So you do the privacy and security and then you map it back to your compliance. You don't do it the other way around, which is, mm -hmm. I think what a lot of people not only used to do, but still do to a large degree. It's like, let's pull out the HIPAA security rule and let's read it. And then we'll do everything that it says on there and figure out what privacy and security we're going to put in place to match these things. And I'm like, ah, no, you're doing it backwards. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, again, and all the rest of this is mindset changes. You know, really the whole thing is all seven of these guiding principles are, in a lot of cases, going to require change in the mindset. Like, a lot of us are already there. Yeah. But, it, but we're the ones that are out there doing this stuff. But isn't that really telling? It it's it To me, it says we don't need another cybersecurity tool. We need to understand from the standpoint of how we're employing these tools and how we look at cybersecurity and how we look at patient safety and and uh, what the culture is within our organizations, those are all the things that really matter. We've got the tools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we've, we've got everything else to point to, to to say this is the framework we should follow and all that. So I, I think that's interesting. Yeah, and and the the big issue here is, you know, well, let's let's finish this because we've got the, I mean, now we're really getting into stuff. Cybersecurity is a business enabler. Yeah. They foster innovation and evolving healthcare business needs. Yeah. That's what cybersecurity can do for us. It's like brakes on your uh, car. You know, the somebody told me one time, the reason why you have brakes on your car is so you can go faster. You know, because yeah. then you have the ability to safely slow down. If you don't have brakes, mm -hmm. then you have to drive slowly because you can't safely stop. <laughs> I love that. That'll be one of our new things. We have our go fast. <laughs> our go fast breaks. There you go. <laughs> then the next thing, and this one, this one I thought was really interesting, is that it's a U.S.-based framework that is globally adaptable. Mm -hmm. Focusing first on U.S. healthcare and public health ecosystem, but be adaptable to global healthcare, cybersecurity, and resilience imperatives. There's a lot of reasons for that. You know, if you think about how much, uh, as they call it now, offshoring uh, takes place, and they're always looking for ways to do more of that, it, we're going to have to have people in other parts of the world adapting these principles as well. But to look at the big picture and say, look, we y'all are doing research. We're doing research. We should be able to share data, not have to worry about privacy, not have to worry about cybersecurity. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for having that. And then the culture of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Constitute a lifetime wellness plan, not limited by tactical constraints of habit or myopia. Oh, I have to look that one up. <laughs> <laughs> here tunnel vision <laughs> so so those are the the um seven guiding principles that the plan said we need to keep all of that in mind as we're putting together this five-year plan and then these are the seven business technology clinical and policy trends that will characterize the evolution of the health sector over the next five years and beyond. So what they're saying is these are the things we expect are going to be happening. They're already happening 
and where we think it's going, and we have to deal with those trends using our principles we just defined. So, trend one, methods of care delivery will continue to shift and evolve. Yep. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> Number two, adoption of emerging and disruptive technologies will accelerate. Whew. Oh, yes. <laughs> We just talked about that when we were talking about AI in the last episode. The business of healthcare will continue to change and adapt. Yep. Yes. Acute financial distress will not abate. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's constant discussion about, you know, the financials requirements of healthcare and how is money spent and where is money spent and where can we better spend our money and, you know, let's cut administrative costs. And then everybody's like, well, I want to cut cybersecurity to cut administrative part. <laughs> exactly. It's, we're dealing with that. <laughs> we need to understand that that's part of it, and that is why it's in there. And then workforce recruitment and talent management will face competitive pressures from supply and demand pressures. Mm -hmm. And that's something also I've been talking about for years. I mean, how many years back do we go, I mean, the CSAM, Cybersecurity Awareness Month is October. We've been doing the champion thing for years. And back in those first days that we were doing it, the early days, every single uh, year we would talk about building the workforce for cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And we could you to do it. And anybody that comes and talks to me and says, well, you know, I was thinking about going into computers or I was thinking, are you interested in potential cybersecurity? And don't think it's just the technical stuff. You know, an art student is a good cybersecurity person. They just don't know it. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more to it. And then number six, we've talked about repeatedly. <laughs> yeah. Government will be challenged to develop balanced policy that achieves objectives in complex health systems. So basically, all the five things that we just told you before are going to make it more complex. And we've also talked about how it's so hard to develop policy within the government restrictions, but the government restrictions are because it's the government. And we have to be, you know, all these layers of concern. So that's tricky. And then we also know that global instability, climate change, and downstream effects will increase pressure on the healthcare supply chain. So if you're a business leader, you should be worried about all those anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I sit down and, and worry about emerging and disruptive technologies accelerating all the time. You know, I was having a cup of coffee just yesterday thinking, wow. Healthcare will continue to change and adapt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that brings us to the cybersecurity goals. Ten cybersecurity goals to meet the challenges posed by those seven industry trends. Hit it, David. Oh. I'm running out of... I gotta go. All right, goal number one. Healthcare and wellness delivery services are user-friendly accessible, safe, secure, and compliant. Goal number one. Goal number two, cybersecurity and privacy practices and responsibilities are understandable to healthcare technology consumers and practitioners. The goal number three, cybersecurity requirements are readily available, harmonized, understandable, and feasible for implementation across all relevant healthcare and public health sectors. Goal number four, Health data, commercially sensitive research, and intellectual property data are reliable and accurate, protected and private, while supporting interoperability requirements. Goal number five, emerging technology is rapidly and routinely accessed for cybersecurity risk and protected to ensure it's safe, secure, and timely use. Goal number six, healthcare technology used inside and outside the organization boundaries is secure by design and secure by default while reducing the cybersecurity burden and cost on technology users. Yes. That's huge. Yeah. Three more goals. Well, four more goals. Goal number seven. 
a trusted healthcare delivery ecosystem is sustained with active partnership and representation between critical and significant technology partners and suppliers, including non-traditional health and life science entities. Hmm. Number eight, foundational resources and capabilities are available to support cybersecurity needs across all healthcare stakeholders, regardless of size, location, and financial standing. Goal number nine, the health and public health sector has established and implemented preparedness response and resilient strategies to enable uninterrupted access to healthcare technology and services. And then lastly, the 10th goal is that organizations across the health sector have strong cybersecurity and privacy cultures that permeate down from the highest levels within each organization. Now, I would say that that last one is the key to attaining all the others. Yeah, I have to agree with you on there. Those are some lofty goals. Tenth one maybe <laughs> the hardest. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know, if you get that one, then you got a chance with the others. But if you don't get that one, you know, we talk about it all the time. If it doesn't start from the top down, if it's not a goal and a focus of leadership, it will not be something that becomes a goal and focus of the organization. So I see that as the number one thing. And the big thing that we've done here is, is they laid out these cybersecurity objectives. So it's, there's 12 objectives. These are the things that we need in to in or in in order to get the goals done that are addressing the trends using our principles. These are the ways that we would do that. And um, you know, I don't want to have to because there there's 12 of those, but you know, develop, adopt, and demand safety and resilience requirements. Okay. And uh, that 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 would be a good thing. <laughs> we know that the secure by design and by default, though. I think that is the second piece because you know we got the leadership has to be part, but the second piece is if we don't have secure by design and by default, then it still falls down to the user of the applications and the tools. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting ones that it puts on here is number eight, uh, increased utilization of automation and emerging technologies such as AI to drive efficiencies in cybersecurity processes. So yeah, um, that's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays yeah. out. Not, not just from a, yeah. an AI standpoint, but even the automation standpoint, because when you start looking at how these things can help uh, a practice to be able to automate things where doctors aren't spending so much time in the notes or, or it's automatically filing insurance and things like that. Th that's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. Yeah. And, and if we look at it, it, it well, it's how we have to look at it. I mean, we just talked about it. it's happening. Mm -hmm. And if we don't direct it and control it, it'll, it's going to control us. Yeah. I think the thing I found interesting yeah. was that th that's an objective is to the, to increase the utilization of it. So I was like, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're not running yeah. from and it. We're going right toward it. <laughs> yeah. And number six is another important objective. Increase utilization of cybersecurity practices, resources, and capabilities by public health, physician practices, and smaller health delivery organizations. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're not. So too they small. are calling it out that we're not talking about just big enterprises. There has to be a way. This has to be in the plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, and number five, enhance health sector senior leadership and board knowledge of cybersecurity and their accountability to create a culture of security within their organization. Which goes back to, you know, if we don't have that. Nothing else is really going to matter. Yeah. Number 12, I thought was interesting. The develop mechanisms to enable mutual uh, aid support across sector stakeholders yes. to allow for timely and effective response to cybersecurity incidents. 
Yes. Yes. So that would be and, interesting. Well, it, well, and it, it's the big, the you know, a big statement. You know, there's patient safety is cyber safety, but you attack one, you attack all. Right. You have to beat us all. And instead of, you know, and and it goes back even to um, Robert, who was who talked about putting together the thing for MSPs, mm-hmm. the nine one one, where we can help each other. We can't just leave it to sucks to be you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll hear about you on the podcast. Think of that. <laughs> Yeah, no, it would be yeah, that, it would be great, especially from a, a small practice standpoint. You know, you have an incident, and they've got somebody they can call, or their IT team has somebody they can call in order to get mutual aid when something happens. Uh, especially if it becomes yeah. something that you know, like you mentioned, it becomes across you know all the clients in a certain area because something happened. We had a bit of a scare earlier in the week. Because one of the remote access tools that many companies use and many I, uh, MSPs use had a critical vulnerability. Now, it was if you're using the cloud version, it was patched within 48 hours. But for me, I'm thinking 48 hours is a long time to hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the other piece of it is that uh, if you aren't using the cloud version and you have your own server set up, then we have no idea when you're going to patch these things. It, there might be some yep. out there still not patched. Yep. And and that is, it, yes. That And so that brings up, by the by, two things. One is there was a huge um, cyber attack. We don't know all the details still, but simultaneously, and this kind of indicates when we're recording it, yesterday, simultaneously, AT&T was down like I've never seen it. Yeah. You know, where you, I mean, and I I know I've saw the headlines. They're telling us what happened. I haven't had a chance to read it. But also in the health sector, a major player, Optimum, Optum owns a lot of companies. And one of them is Change Healthcare and it's Revenue Cycle Management, all these other things. And that is utilized by a lot of different services. And, you know, I sent it to our guys and I was like, okay, right now the health systems are battling this because it immediately impacted them. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to move a meeting. That's what happens in the cybersecurity working group. We had to move a meeting because all the people that were going to participate, a whole bunch of the speakers were busy dealing with that cyber attack. So, we had that simultaneously, which says the supply chain is huge. Mm-hmm. And number 10, develop meaningful cross-sector third-party risk management strategies for evaluating, monitoring, and responding to supply chain and third-party provider cyber risk. Yeah. That's huge. And that's exactly why. Those two things had to have impacted the vast majority of the sector in some way. Oh, yeah. It w- you know, we got a note. One of our clients called us and said, oh, by the way, uh, one of the things we use uses data that it pulls from Change Healthcare. Hmm. So that function of this tool that we use, we don't, that function is the thing that we can't do now until that's fixed. Yeah. Well, imagine if your incident response plan for communication is that everybody's going to use these cell phones that you have AT and T service through, <laughs> and if you I know, yeah, right? and if you had to respond to something during that time frame, and and now that's not even there. So, what's your plan B? <laughs> yeah, and so this, and it was complicated to get people to understand. Mm-hmm. Like, if you had landline connection, as we call it, which is most of the time fiber now, so like you know, I have fiber buried run into the house as long as that is working i could still make calls that were wi-fi calls right but the fact that you know people were there were people that couldn't find the place they were supposed to go for meetings because they couldn't use the gps because (laughs) at&t was down i know of at least one case of that that i've already heard about yeah well i'm on verizon so i didn't even notice it but even beyond that 
almost all the calls I make are typically through uh, apps that we use. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, my team, we don't communicate with each other through email or through uh, typical means of communication. So it's all very specific means. So um, <laughs> I didn't even notice anything was going on until late afternoon. Yeah, but you take away your internet. Oh, yeah. You're all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and trying to explain that, it's like you you won't, not only can you not make a call on your phone, but you can't use the other things unless you are connected to a Wi-Fi service that is not, you know, piped in via Wi-Fi, via uh, cellular or whatever we call it now, mm-hmm. communications. Wireless communications, there's a lot of folks that are getting those wireless. I mean, I know folks that have the wireless service, you know, and they got great signals that are near a tower and they get, you know, really consistent speeds. Yeah. But what if that goes down? Yeah. And some of these rural areas, you got one ISP to pick from. That's it. Yep. Well, that happened to you years ago yeah. where it was like, you know, yeah, we just now have two. Uh, service providers in our area. And it's not even everywhere in our area. <laughs> it's just <laughs> some of our area has two options. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's the big thing is telecommunications is the backbone of everything. And all of our technology rides on it today. So that's huge. And I'm sure that there are a lot of people that haven't slept in days because that started like in the middle of the night with AT and T, <laughs> and uh, you know I'm sure they still haven't gone to sleep. So anyway, we, um, let's let's get back to our uh, strategic plan mobilization. Yeah. So yeah, the the shared responsibility thing, mm-hmm. and I like this uh, in the spirit of the shared responsibility. If the industry is to achieve the ambitious goals and objectives that will deliver us to the future state we envision, it will take the collective and collaborative efforts of all private sector and government stakeholders. (laughs) Yeah, it's a big lift. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I like. But again, yeah, I like the first one though. The very first thing they say is our messaging. Our messaging is going to be cyber safety is patient safety. We're going to, we're going to mm-hmm. double down on that on, you know, social media, peer network conferences, podcasts, webinars, paid media, free media, whatever it is. That's, that's our messaging. Cyber safety is patient yep. safety. So we're just going to have to start adding that to our hip is not about compliance. It's about patient care. Cyber safety is patient safety. I don't know what you're going to do, but that's your problem. <laughs> that's too uh, much already. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just alternate, yeah. just whatever you feel like, and and then we'll see what you come up with. But having a policy, so regulatory alignment to these things, but also incentives and subsidies for the under-resourced organizations. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, I mean, we've we've talked about they they're trying all these new ways because again, you look at what we talked about just with AI, how expensive some of this stuff will be. I mean, I'm already, you know, oh, add $20 a month per user to add this AI feature to your tool. Well, if I don't do it, I'm going to be left behind, you know? So I'm already having to make that decision. And then uh, enhance information sharing and collaborative incident response. Huge. Mm-hmm. And, you know, support from law enforcement. And we're starting to work some of that out. But again, you get into some of these areas where the law, local law enforcement is like, I don't know, you don't, don't talk to me about that. Yeah, no, you, you're starting to get into the, the federal level, really. Yeah. And then you get, well, in Atlanta, we're, kind of starting to have to ramp that up everywhere as you know they're still dealing anyway and then innovation actually doing cybersecurity research product security and sector development of sound practices and governance models yeah i think they're doing that already i mean you look at stuff like the cmmc that's come out and and some of the other things and and government's pushing out frameworks left and right 
Nunista's revamping mm-hmm. frameworks. I mean, now more than ever, you've got the resources as far as informational resources on how to do. Right. And and so then we have where our target future state. Where do we want to end up? And, it, you know, I, I didn't bring this up in the beginning, but they go back to 2017 and say we were in critical condition then. Because remember, 2016 is when we really started seeing them shutting down hospitals with ransomware and that kind of stuff. And 2017, we weren't responding to the threat increases. Hardly at all. Right. You know, and now this is a regular thing. So going back to 2017, you know, there was nothing s- seriously happening from a sector level. I mean, there were a lot of little pockets like us and a lot of folks doing things, but the sector level is where we have to do things. So this is kind of like how they ended up with PCI DSS. Mm -hmm. You know, the financial sector came up with the rules for managing credit card transactions. So our things, where we go, if we're going to be, this is what it takes for us to be considered to be in stable condition. And with this plan, it's five years. Yeah. So this is our corrective action plan. I know. (laughs) For the entire sector. (laughs) Ain't nobody got time for that. (laughs) So it's, it's ingrained as a public health and patient safety standard, first and foremost. And what that means is... Both practiced and regulated healthcare cybersecurity is reflexive, evolving, accessible, documented, and implemented for practitioners and patients. Now, there was a key point there. The and patients part. Yeah. We're having a hard time getting the practitioners to go. I mean, come on. That. That. That's a lift. I don't know that we have, you know, the patients are going to be the last step of the plan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's patients like you and I, you know, our, like, you and, and me, me and you are not the normal people. <laughs> no, you're definitely not normal. <laughs> uh, hello, kettle. <laughs> I call the kettle black. <laughs> All right. The other thing is the secure design and implementation where everything in the ecosystem is shared and collaboratively responsible. C-suite ownership. They embrace, first of all, that's funny, embrace accountability for cybersecurity as enterprise risk and a technology imperative. Yeah. I mean, I think this is like a 50-year plan. <laughs> <laughs> but again, if that doesn't happen, nothing else happens. I know, but I still think that's one of the hardest pieces because well, it's the hardest one, and and how they're going to get there. But you know, that's it has to start higher than where you and I are at. Yeah, it's one of those, you know, and it is starting. It, it is, but for my experience has always been that the C suite they're not they don't care until there's a problem. And it's like, okay, it's too late to care now. It's like, now are you going to pay attention to your teeth now that they've all fallen out? Okay. A little too, <laughs> too late to go to the dentist now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. And then this is, now again, this is where we want to be. And this is important for all those folks that are like, I don't have time. I don't have the resources. I don't have all of this. There is a cyber safety net that under-resourced health organizations are supported in the form of financial, policy, and technical assistance ensuring cyber equity across the ecosystem. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Not sure how they'd pull it off, but that would be fantastic. Well, you know, and that's something we've been trying to figure out for a while. So, I mean, there's a lot of people with a lot more resources and, and awareness than you and I, and they're figuring it out. Hopefully. Yeah. Because we got to get there. In in order to be there in five years, we've got to get there now or start down that path 
that's going to be a key element. But again, without the C-suite, we're not going to get that support. Yeah. Well, the next one, the next future state, yes. you and I absolutely can help bring about, which is yes. cyber competence. Workforce learning and application uh, is an infrastructure wellness continuum. So, yes, we can absolutely help with cyber health and wellness. Yeah, I mean, we do our part to help with all of this. You know, we can't, yeah, we do our part, but that is a key place. And that's why we have HIPAA for MSPs and Card and Club is that's our focus. Yeah. You know, we do the other stuff and we want to teach and we want to reach out, but it's that having the people that are responsible for making sure that that competency happens in the workforce, they need support. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. We well, you know that. But the last one is the big one. Before we hit that one, it yeah. just hit me though. That would be, if you're talking to C-suite ownership, you know, everybody's always talking about your, your wellness plans for your, for your team, which typically is, you know, you're paying for their uh, gym memberships or whatever it is. There's a wellness plan. If you include cyber wellness into that, then you can merge the two to where you do absolutely address the cyber competence within your normal business health and wellness plan. Well, and I mean, that's why we've, you know, talked about cyber hygiene for so long. Yeah. You know, I mean, we've been doing that for years, but it is, it has to be where, you know, all the people that say, well, I don't, I don't know anything about the computers. I just click until it works. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. The secure design and implementation has to fix those people's ability mm -hmm. to get in trouble, but they have, it's a shared responsibility. Yeah. Maybe the, uh, they have to pick up the pace too. Maybe your workforce wellness program would be that you're covering the anti malware service on their home computers. <laughs> so they're practicing cyber safety everywhere. Yeah. Well, we've talked about the need to do that, and uh, we we deal with those issues. We'll just leave it at that. All right, let's come. Let's go to the big one. So the 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 big drum roll. Yes, drum roll, please. Nine one one cyber civil defense. Wow, ensures that early warning, incident response, and recovery are reflexive, collaborative, and always on. Hmm. I could call 911 about all kinds of things except for a cyber attack. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know, if you do, they're like, what do you want me to do? I'm sorry, this is for real emergencies. No, no, this is an emergency. Yeah. People's lives are at stake. Patient safety is at stake. They need to be able to call. Yeah. And again, it goes back to Robert's idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, right now, Really, we are the 911 first responders for that, the, the IT community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, we can only do so much, so we got to figure out where we're going to do things. You know? Mm -hmm. We've got to do that. And for people who say, well, I'm going to call IT, they've got to call people. Yeah. You know, there's not enough of them. No. They don't know everything. They don't sit around... You know, it's kind of like when we say, if you lose 50 computers in a flood, they're not sitting there holding 50 computers ready to run in <laughs> as soon as the water recedes. Well, if you if you want to equate it to the physical world of like law enforcement, for, for example, some departments, a lot of them, most of them even, they have SWAT teams. But the SWAT teams mm -hmm. only come out when there's an incident mm -hmm. to in, to come out to. So they're not out there patrolling the streets and all this as a SWAT team. They're, they're incident specific, which is very much what your cyber teams are. Oftentimes you have other people that are patrolling and that are looking at log files and they're looking for things and they're doing the initial uh, uh, response and investigation. But then as soon as they find out that it's a hostage situation, it's a ransomware attack, then guess what? Now the IT SWAT teams get called out. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I like it, David. SWAT teams. Although we have to come up with what? Oh, uh, no. An old new thing for <laughs> acronyms. But we need to come up with acronyms that you can say like SWAT. 
<laughs> instead of some of the others that we have that Hicks we can't talk, It's a Hicksquat. <laughs> there you go, Hicksquat. <laughs> oh, Lord. So, as we say often, okay, that's just enough for us today. <laughs> We need to stop. <laughs> roll it up. All right, folks. Thanks for listening. That is our show for today. Be sure to share it out and uh, leave us a review like we asked in the beginning. If you haven't done it yet, what are you waiting on? <laughs> Go do it. So remember. Subscribe. Yeah, do all this We stuff. need that too. And uh, check out our YouTube channel. We hadn't mentioned that in a while. Go check that out. Yeah. So remember for Donna and myself, the HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care and safety. <laughs> Help me with hip hop. Let's get it right. Protect your patients. Day and night. Donna and David, the experts on your side. Help me with hip hop. Let's get it right. You've been listening to the Help Me with Hip Hop podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.